the first chapter in the book Patience is about patience with self. And so many of us feel that even as we are patient with others, with family and friends, we have trouble being patient with ourselves. And there's a subchapter in the chapter about patience with self that is about no self. And after all, you can't really have a book based on Buddhist teachings without at least touching the subject of no self. And before getting into that, this is going to be a great opportunity to watch the workings of your own mind. Because even the words no self, if you haven't really spent time with this, what comes up? It has to be something strange. Uh, what is it about? Is it going to make any sense? And what we look for is how open am I to thoughts and ideas that are different from my own and sometimes that are really different from my own. It doesn't mean that we automatically say, oh yes, I agree with everything that I hear, but how open can I be to listening? The research that I did before beginning this book showed that the number one reason that people said they dealt with impatience was when they felt they weren't being heard by extension and they felt they weren't being seen or they were kind of invisible uh, not being honored so imagine if we all tend to feel that way so do others when they feel they're not being heard by us so the development of what we call beginner's mind the ability to listen with an open mind is a great gift to ourselves and to others. So as to no self, or in some contexts translated as not self, first thing I want to do is assure you that you really do have a self. You are here, there is a you. Check it if you wish. Yes, here I am, okay. What the Buddha was, was teaching and what he was offering was not that there isn't such a thing as you, but what he was questioning is, is the misperception of I, me, mine, and where those labels take us. So, to help us understand this idea that there isn't actually a core, a, a black box, inner, um, a thing within that is Alan, or Margaret, or Allison, but even without that core, there still is you. You are there. So the Buddha tried to illustrate this in one teaching where he used a chariot as an example. And he said, the wheels are not the chariot. The spokes of the wheels are not the chariot. The rails connecting the wheels to the cart are not the chariot. The cart is not the chariot. But it requires all of these component parts to have something that we would call a chariot. Take away the component parts and there isn't a thing, a self, any longer to be called chariot. Uh, the Vietnamese monk Thich Nhat Hanh would use a flower as an example. Take away the petals, the stamen, the leaves, the stem, and what you have is a series of parts, which Buddhists call aggregates, which is kind of a nicer translation than the more accurate translation, which is heaps. But you know, we don't 
want to think of ourselves as heaps, so we'll say aggregates. These aggregates put back together, and then we have a flower. But when we take the, the pieces, the aggregates apart, we see that it is what we call empty of a self. The word in Sanskrit is shunyata, which means empty. So when you hear Buddhists speak of emptiness, it doesn't mean non-existent. There is no nihilism involved here. Definitely not. But to understand that there isn't a fixed, permanent self. So 2,500 years ago, science, research, comes to the same conclusion. By looking with instruments, um, what are they, neuro, neuro MRI kind of things, whatever they are called, what are they called? Functional. Functional. Functional MRIs. Yeah. They really look inside, and they've come to exactly the same conclusion. They cannot find a thing, a specific part, that is the self. We are comprised of aggregates. So what? Who cares? What's the difference? The reason we want to look at this is, if there isn't such a thing as this self, which we tend to really treasure and value, then our concept of things like I, mine, me, may be misleading. And without such concepts, we may find ourselves not so uh, motivated to defend, to insist upon that there might be a bit more spaciousness, a bit more ease, a bit more willingness, and certainly a sense of deeper insight into the connectedness of all beings. That there isn't this isolated me, I. Again, that's the idea of shunyata, of empty, of a separate self. And yet, at the same time, this package within a body, experiencing ongoing, constantly, thoughts, feelings, and sensations. So the Buddhists say that that is the experience of sentient beings, this ongoing arising and dying away of thoughts, feelings, and sensations. But they don't belong to anyone. They're simply experience. I know it doesn't seem that way, because this is a different view. An ongoing arising and dying away of experience. So it's as if there are thoughts, but no thinker. Feelings, but no feeler. Emotions, but no emoter. That's the part that really takes some sitting with for a while. And I just tell you from my own experience, over the course of time, I found my own uh, kind of grasp of this just deepen. I could, you know, started with a little bit of kind of intellectual understanding and perhaps a sense of, okay, I don't have to deny this, I can say, all right, I can think about this. And then in stages, I found myself seeing deeper and deeper into this. 
including just recently when this book came out. And I looked at this and uh, someone said to me, how does this feel to have another book published? And I found it difficult to explain that it's not what you would think it is. There just isn't any, oh wow, I had another book published because it's as if there just isn't that kind of an eye about it. It's an event that happened, it's a very pleasant event, but it's said that all phenomena have tones of either pleasant, unpleasant, or somewhere in the middle, kind of neutral. Yes, I'd much rather have a book published than have it rejected. Yes, it's wonderful that if there's something of benefit in the book, it will reach people. But it just isn't about a self. It's kind of an event that happens. Very pleasant, very nice. And there it is. So when someone comes to me and says, you know that book you wrote? Ugh, don't like it. You're way off base. It's okay. More pleasant if someone says, you know that book I, you wrote? Greatest book ever written. Shakespeare had nothing on you. Great. Nice, pleasant. Unpleasant, pleasant. Great. Arises, passes away. It really was a useful experience for me to, to realize that that was what the experience was. So I suspect that we will have some questions about this. Why don't we take just two or three minutes to sit with it, and especially to notice within the mind resistance, acceptance, it's okay, a willingness to sit with this, a willingness, but I do have questions. See what is going on. What is the experience within the mind and know that whatever that experience is, it's fine. That's it. 